Welcome to lesson number four on Survey of Theology. In today's lesson, we're going to cover uh, the next two sections. We're going to talk about God the Son, His deity, and eternity. And we are also going to talk about the Incarnation. Here, opening with an introduction, a uh, quote from, <clears throat> from Dr. Lewis Berry Chafer. And uh, this quote is going to come from Major Bible Themes. He says, quote, The scriptures present the Lord Jesus Christ as being at the same time perfectly human and perfectly divine. Because of this, he was both like and unlike other men. According to John 1.14, 1 Timothy 3.16, and Hebrews 2.14-17, Jesus was revealed to be a man among men who was born, who lived, who suffered, and who died. Scripture is equally clear he was unlike man in that he was eternally pre-existent. He was entirely sinless in his human life. Uh, his death was a sacrifice for the sins of the whole world, and he manifested his divine power in his glorious resurrection and ascension. <clears throat> End quote. <clears throat> and so he's absolutely right. Now, uh, let's talk about uh, statements. Let's talk about direct statements of the eternity and deity of the Son of God. In John 1, 1 and 2, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So, you have to catch the language here. So, he's talking about how the Word was with God. So, here you have a distinction between Word and God, and here God here, I believe, to be God the Father. And the Word was with God, and the Word, which was with God, was God. So you have God the Father here and <clears throat> God the Son. And it says in verse 2, He was in the beginning with God. In John 5.18, <clears throat> it says, For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but catch this, but was also calling God uh, his own Father, making himself equal with God. Now, you have to understand the logic here. In this sense, when he, when he is calling God his own father, he's making himself equal with God. Uh, and the Jews understood this. Uh, <clears throat> and then you think of passages like John 8:58 where Jesus, speaking to the religious leader, said, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Now, the phrase here, I am, translates uh, two Greek words, ego emi, ego emi, which is translated just simply, I am. But it's the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew Yahweh, uh, which uh, was the doubling of the Hebrew verb hayah, which is the verb to be, and so it's the idea that God is the eternally existent one, but he is Yahweh, is who he's claiming to be. And of course, the Jews understood this <laughs> uh, when he made this claim, because when he says before, uh, before Abraham was, that is, and Abraham was roughly about 2,000 years before uh, the hypostatic union, before uh, God the Son took upon himself humanity. So when Jesus here is talking, by the way, we should understand that there are times that Jesus uh, spoke and operated from his divine nature. He is undiminished deity combined together with perfect humanity. Both are true. Now, as God, he's omniscient. He knows all things. As God, he's omnipresent. He's equally and fully everywhere all the time. As God, he's omnipotent, which means he's all-powerful and able to accomplish all that he desires. He is also righteous and just and just and sovereign and loving and immutable and truthful and gracious, and kind, and merciful, and, and, and eternal, and all the things that belong to God. We talk about the attributes of God, and I've talked about that recently, so you know what I'm talking about. Uh, but there were times uh, in the hypostatic union where he spoke from his divine nature. Now, clearly here, when he says, before Abraham was, 
I am. He's, he's basically saying, I am Yahweh. I am the one who called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees. Oh, by the way, I'm also the one who called Moses to liberate my people from Egyptian captivity. Oh, by the way, I'm the one who gave the Mosaic law to the nation of Israel. Oh, by the way, I'm the one who created the nation of Israel. Oh, by the way, uh, I'm the one who created the whole universe and the earth and everything that is on it. I mean, he is Yahweh. He is a Goami. He is the great I am. That's who he is. And so big claim here, but it's a truth claim. And so he's talking, he's talking out of his divine nature. Now, there were times in his humanity where Jesus got hungry. He got tired. He had to sleep. Uh, he could become weak. Well, these are things that are only true of humanity. Uh, when he went to the cross and died, it was his humanity that went to the cross and died. God can't die, uh, but in his humanity. And Peter says that in his own body, he bore our sins. That's, that's his humanity. And so one must realize that there were times that when Christ spoke or, or Christ acted, he was operating out of his divine nature. But then there were times that he uh, spoke and acted out of his human nature. And one must understand that both are simultaneously true. We'll talk about the hypostatic union more here in a little bit. But uh, that just jumps off the page at me when I'm reading John 8, 58. <laughs> Clearly a reference to his divine nature. John 10, 33. Uh, the Jews answered him, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, which is because they rejected uh, him as the Messiah, uh, because you, being a man, make yourself out to be what? God. Now listen, I, I hear people say, oh, well, Jesus never claimed to be deity. That's just dumb. That's just dumb. Look, the Jews understood this. They understood what his claims meant. And they understood that when he, when he said, before Abraham was, a go of me, they knew what that meant. They understood it correctly. And here, when he makes him, when, when he, uh, when he acts, he makes himself out to be God. They understood that. They understood his claims to deity. John 17, 5. Now, Father, glorify uh, me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you, notice, before the world was. So here, Jesus, uh, talking out of his divine nature is talking about a shared experience that he has with God the Father, and which would have also been true of God the Holy Spirit for all three members of the Godhead. But he's praying to the Father, and he says, Glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you. Well, when was this? Before the world existed. <laughs> Before the world was. Again, a very clear statements with regard to his deity. Uh, Philippians, uh, John 20, 28, that Thomas, who saw the resurrected Lord, uh, says to him, my Lord and my God. Thomas understood who Jesus was, clearly understood who Jesus was. Philippians 2, 5 through 7, Paul says, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, uh, did not regard equality with uh, with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. And the word emptied here is a, a word of a big controversy. It's kanao, and uh, it's referred to as the doctrine of kenosis, uh, the doctrine of kenosis. Uh, and, uh, and this is a survey of theology, so we're not mining into the depths of some of these uh, theological terms, uh, but I'm just simply introducing you to them. Again, this is a survey of theology course. The temptation for me is to want to like dig in and to get into the weeds, but this is just a survey of theology, so I'm just like a stone skipping across the water. I'm just touching lightly on some of these things, but introducing you to some of the language and focusing mainly on the biblical passages because that's where uh, truth lies and that's where we get our understanding of God and, and what is. But he emptied himself. Now, some say that he actually gave up or um, uh, ceased to be God, that he gave up some of his attributes. And again, when we think about the attributes of God, we think about his sovereignty, immutability, righteousness, justice, love, uh, veracity, eternal life, and so on. We think of those attributes that belong to God. And some would argue that he 
actually gave up some of those attributes? Well, to do so would make him less than God. What he gave up was the uh, was the voluntary use of those attributes. In other words, he limited himself in at certain times uh, in his humanity uh, because uh, his humanity was needed uh, for him to go to the cross, for example, that he had to go to the cross and he had to die. Well, he had to be human and he had to uh, uh, place himself uh, upon the cross uh, in order to die for the sins of humanity. So this is uh, this is something where he could have stopped it. You see, as God, he could have stopped it all. I mean, he could have just blinked or snapped his fingers or just simply thought or spoke and, just, and brought it all to an end. I mean, he could have, but he didn't. And so he uh, submitted himself in his humanity to go to the cross. And even in his humanity, he struggled. And, and understand this, in his humanity, he struggled. Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, Three times he prayed, Father, if, it, uh, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, this cup of suffering, this cup of the cross. Christ knew what he was facing. But he ultimately surrendered himself, and he said, but not my will, but thy will be done. And so when we see these passages, we must remember that, that, uh, that he humbled himself, but he existed in the form of God. He actually existed in the form of God, uh, Morphe. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. But we should understand that he is, in fact, God. And again, I'm just hitting on a few verses that demonstrate this point. In Hebrews 1.8, uh, it says, but, the, but of the Son... And here's talking about Jesus, but of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. So there are uh, direct statements of the eternity and deity of the Son of God. Now, what are some of the implications uh, concerning the Son of God? Uh, implications that the Son of God is eternal. Well, first of all, the works of creation are ascribed to him. Think of John 1, 3. Uh, again, speaking of Jesus, that all things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Uh, and so the, the logic here is that he must therefore exist before all creation, because he's the one who brought it into creation. The Father worked through him, but also Christ himself uh, brought these things into being. Colossians 1.16, for by him all things were created. This is Jesus. All things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. So the implication is that he must therefore exist before all creation. Jesus is the angel of Jehovah. He is the angel of Jehovah that appears in the Old Testament. Uh, quoting here from Chafer. Uh, let's see. And this is going to be from major Bible themes. He says, quote, Though he appears at times as an angel or even as a man, he bears the unmistakable marks of deity. He appeared to, a he appeared to Hagar, uh, to Abraham. And this, these are the occurrences of, uh, of the angel of the Lord is what he's talking about, which is a theophany. It's an Old Testament appearance of Christ. But getting back to Chafer here, he says, He appeared to Hagar, to Abraham, to Jacob, to Moses to Joshua, and to Manoah. He it is who fights for and defends his own, end quote. And by the way, uh, we know that the angel of the Lord is uh, Jehovah uh, because of how he's regarded and the fact that he receives worship. Because again, only God can receive worship. Notice the passage in, in uh, <clears throat> Joshua 13, excuse me, Joshua chapter 5, verse 13 and 14. Now it came about when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing opposite with him with his sword drawn. This is the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ, <coughs> excuse me again, uh, with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No, rather I indeed come now as captain of the host of the Lord, 
And so this is, uh, this is the appearance of uh, Jesus Christ. And notice what happens here. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and bowed down and said to him, What has my Lord to say to his servant? And so here he bows down to worship him. Point number three, Jesus holds titles of deity. Titles of deity. And uh, here I'm quoting again from Chafer. Uh, he says, quote, The titles of the Lord, Jesus Christ, indicate his eternal being. He is precisely what his names imply. He is the Son of God. He is the only begotten Son. Now let me pause for just a moment there, because I've mentioned before, the phrase only begotten is better translated as uniquely born. Uniquely born. It's monogenes. Uh, some say monogenes weos, uh, the only begotten Son, or monogenes theos, which is what uh, John 1.18 says. But he should be, it should probably be better rendered as uniquely born. So let me get back to the quote here. So Chaper says, quote, The titles of the Lord Jesus Christ indicate his eternal being. He is precisely what his names imply. He is the Son of God. He is the only begotten Son, the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, the Lord, the Lord of all, the Lord of glory, the Christ, wonderful, counselor, the mighty God, the Father of eternity, uh, God, God with us, our great God. These titles relate him to the Old Testament revelation of Jehovah God. Uh, end quote. <clears throat> and so you can chase down those scripture references there. And point number four, Jesus possesses the attributes of God. He possesses the attributes of God. Quoting again from Dr. Lewis Berry Chafer, he says, quote, The preexistence and eternity of the Son of God are implied in the fact that he has the attributes of God, that is, he has life, self-existence, immutability. And you think of Hebrews 13, 18, where he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Well, let me pause here for just a moment, because to say that Jesus Christ um, is the same yesterday, today, and forever uh, means that he doesn't change. It's part of his attribute of immutability, but also his eternity. And so again, we should realize this. <clears throat> so let me go back to the quote here. So the preexistence and eternity of the Son of God are implied in the fact that he has the attributes of God. He has life, self-existence, immutability, truth, love, holiness, eternity, omnipresence, omniscience, and omnipotence, end quote. And Jesus is worshipped as God. He is worshipped as God. And according to Dr. Chafer, again, quote, in like manner, the pre-existence and eternity of Christ are implied in the fact that he is worshipped as God. It follows that since the Lord Jesus Christ is God, he is from everlasting to everlasting, end quote. And so, again, we think of passages <clears throat> like where Thomas says of Jesus, my Lord and my God, or Stephen uh, falls down and he calls upon the name of the Lord and he says, receive my spirit. So these are examples of them, of them acknowledging uh, uh, Jesus as God. So again, very clear statements. And, you know, I just, I scratch my head sometimes when I, when I meet people who say, oh, well, Jesus never claimed to be God. Well, that's not what the Jews understood. The Jews understood his claims to be God. Now, they rejected it, uh, and they wanted to kill him for it. They thought he was guilty of blasphemy. Of course, he wasn't. They're the ones who were uh, mistaken and completely out of line. But they understood that. And others recognized him as God. And so the, the weight of evidence is really, really quite compelling uh, concerning the uh, deity and the eternity of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> All right, so let's now move into God the Son, his incarnation. Incarnation. Now, the word incarnation, as I mentioned before, uh, uh, means literally in flesh. Uh, you have the preposition in, and then the word carnos here. We see it like a chili con carne, a chili with meat. To be incarnous, like a, like a carnivore, it, it's literally meat. It's a crude statement, but it refers to the humanity of Christ. 
And so it's referred to as his incarnation. So at a point in time, God the Son added to himself humanity. And, and this, is, this is how this should be understood, because God the Son is eternal. Uh, just like God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, they're all eternal. So at a point in time, God the Son added to himself humanity, forever uniting his divine nature with a perfect, sinless human nature, becoming the God-man, the theanthropic person, theos, God, anthropos, man. He is theanthropic. And so he is 100% God, and he is perfect uh, humanity. Both are true at the same time. It's not a 50-50 split. It is 100% God and 100% man. And when the union occurs, it is a forever union. In other words, once the union occurred in the womb of the Virgin Mary, uh, once God the Son took upon himself humanity, that humanity, <clears throat> that union between those two natures will go into eternity. So Jesus ascended bodily to heaven, Acts chapter 1. He's bodily in heaven right now. When he returns at his second coming, Revelation 19, he will return bodily. When he rules uh, on the earth from Jerusalem, on the throne of David uh, in Jerusalem, uh, he will rule bodily because he's still in that same body. And that will go into eternity. Once the union occurred, it is forever. It is forever. <clears throat> Again, John 1.1. 1, 1. By the way, you, you'll learn something about me as a teacher. And that is that I am very, very prone to repetition. And unapologetically so. I will go over something and I will hit the same verse sometimes a dozen times. Uh, just to simply drive the point. Because that is how we learn. We learn by repetition. We go over and over and over and over and we just get it into our thinking. And this is how we learn in life. This is how we learn um, a basic arithmetic. I, uh, arithmetic. I remember going through the times table when I was a kid in the third grade, and I had to memorize it, you know, a one times one all the way up to 12 times 12, and it was very helpful to me. But you go over it 100 times, you get it into your brain. When I was uh, studying Greek, uh, you had to go through these, uh, these paradigms, uh, and you had to uh, understand the use of the Greek verb paradigms. And so you would memorize these things and you would say, luo, 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 um, and you would go over this paradigm over and over and over. Uh, and so you would go over these paradigms and you would just say them a couple thousand times in your head until eventually you had it into your thinking. But that's how we learn. We learn by repetition. We just go over it and over and over until it just becomes, you know, so integrated into our thinking that we know it. So, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. <clears throat> and the Word became flesh. That's the hypostatic union. That is the hypostatic union. That is God the Son taking upon himself humanity. This occurred roughly 2,000 years ago in time and space, and it was a real union. That occurred. So, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He walked among men. John 1 and 8, 1 18, <clears throat> no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God, the monogenes theos, the uniquely born one. And Jesus is unique. He, he was unique, is unique. No one has ever existed like him. Now, he is perfect humanity. Uh, he is perfect humanity, and he had to be. To go to the cross and to die as a substitute for humanity, he had to be fully human. Uh, so in that sense, but he's also undiminished deity. And he was born sinless. He did not inherit Adam's original sin. He committed no personal sin. Uh, and when he went to the cross, he died a penal substitutionary death. Penal, he bore the penalty for our sins. Substitutionary, he died as a substitute in our place and bore the punishment that rightfully belongs to us. And, and it was an atoning sacrifice, and it was propitiatory to the Father. The Father was completely satisfied with the death of Christ. He was completely satisfied. And so he is fully God and fully man. But no one has seen God at any time. The uniquely born God, 
And he is God. Don't, don't miss that. He is the uniquely born God who is in the bosom of the Father. He has explained him. Now, in the field of systematic theology, this is called the hypostatic union. Uh, in his systematic theology, and here I'm quoting not from major Bible themes, but from Dr. Chafer's systematic theology, uh, specifically volume 1, page 383, he says, quote, Though his deity is eternal, his humanity was gained in time. Therefore, the theanthropic person destined to be such forever began with the incarnation, end quote. So there is a lot, boy, there's so much uh, that is packed into that statement. Talking about his deity, his humanity, the fact that it was gained at a point in time. He's called the theanthropic person, the God-man, destined to be such forever, to go into that. And it began with the incarnation, in which he was conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary. This is called parthenogenesis, from the Greek word parthenos, which means virgin. Have you ever heard of the Parthenon? Uh, the, the Greek structure uh, in Greece, the, the, the temple there called the Parthenon. Well, the Greek word Parthenos uh, means virgin, and ganao means to be born. And so when we talk about, um, um, <clears throat> when we talk about uh, Parthenogenesis, we're talking about the virgin conception, virgin birth. And so this occurred at a moment in time in the womb of the Virgin Mary. But this was the incarnation. This is when he took upon himself humanity. And Mary is the mother of the humanity of Jesus. This is called Christotakos, takos, to bear, and, and Christ referring to his humanity. She is the bearer of the humanity of, 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 of Christ, uh, of, his, of his human nature. Uh, but some would argue, the Catholic Church in particular, would say that she is Theotokos, that she is the mother of God, the bearer of God. Well, <laughs> uh, that to me just blows the mind because God doesn't have a mother. And um, <clears throat> that is so out of line. Anyway, she's Christotokos. And that occurred at the moment of Parthenogenesis when Jesus was conceived in her womb. Now, God the Son, <clears throat> going on in the notes here, God the Son did not indwell a human. He did not just simply indwell a human, uh, but forever added humanity to himself. He added humanity to himself. And according to Paul Enns, whom I like, and here I'm quoting from the Moody Handbook of Theology, the Moody Handbook of Theology, he says, quote, when Christ came, a person came, not just a nature. He took on an additional nature, a human nature. He did not simply dwell in a human person. The result of the union of the two natures is the theanthropic person, the God-man, end quote. Now, reading through the Gospels, there were times that Jesus operated from his divine nature, and we can see examples where he forgave sins. Uh, like when Jesus healed the paralytic. And he says to him, your sins are forgiven. <laughs> well, uh, some of the scribes began reasoning in their hearts and say, why does he speak this way? He is blaspheming. Notice what? For who can forgive sins but God alone? You see, again, they understood what Jesus was claiming here. They said, who can forgive sins but God alone? Well, if Jesus forgave sins, then guess what? That means that he's God. And so, again, you, you, you have to read through these things. You have to read through these things. And again, in John uh, 8, 50, uh, 56 through 58, uh, Jesus here speaking to the uh, Pharisees, he says, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and, and, saw, and he saw it and was glad. And the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old and have you seen Abraham? Now this helps us to understand his age at this time. Doesn't give us an exact time frame, but they understood that he was under 50. 
And this is where Jesus makes his statement, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, ago a me, I am. So there were times that he spoke from his divine nature. In John chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus says, I and the Father are one, that is, one in essence. And the Jews uh, picked up stones again to stone him. Why? <laughs> well, Jesus answered, I showed you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you stoning me? And the Jews answered him, for a good work we do not stone you, but, but for blasphemy. Uh, and because you being a man make yourself out to be God. Again, there were times that he spoke from his divine nature. And other times that he spoke from his human nature. Times that he spoke from his human nature. And you think of Matthew 4, 2, which says that after he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, he became hungry, which is literally as hungry as one could be. But there were times that he spoke from his, uh, when, where we see his human nature on display, Luke 8, 23. Uh, now, on one of those days, Jesus and his disciples got into a boat. Well, there's his humanity, because only humanity can get into the boat. God's omnipresent. And he said to them, let us go over to the other side of the lake. So they launched out. But as they were sail sailing, he fell asleep. God doesn't sleep, <laughs> but he fell asleep. And so we see examples here where we see his human nature, John 19, 28, uh, where he said after this on the cross, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished, he, fulf he uh, to fulfill the scripture said, I'm thirsty. God doesn't get thirsty. So again, here we see examples where we see his divine nature on display, and then there are times where we see his human nature on display. So again, we want to keep both in mind here. Sorry, my notes keep jumping around here. So concerning both natures, Paul ends, writes, he says, he says the two natures, I have to switch over here. He says here, the two natures of Christ are inseparably united without mixture or loss of separate identity. Uh, he remains forever the God-man. He remains forever the God-man, fully God and fully man, two distinct natures in one person forever. Though Christ sometimes operated in the sphere of his humanity, uh, and in other cases, in the sphere of his deity, in all cases, what he did and what he was could be attributed to his one person. So he's one person. <clears throat> Let me carry on here with uh, uh, Dr. N's point. Even though it is evident that there were two natures in Christ, he is never considered a dual personality. He's one person, uh, two natures. So he's never considered a dual personality. In summarizing, he says the hypostatic union, in summarizing the hypostatic union, three facts are noted. One, Christ has two distinct natures, uh, both humanity and deity. Two, there is no mixture or intermingling of the two natures. And three, although he has two natures, Christ is one person. So let me say that again. Here, citing from Dr. Paul Ince uh, concerning the hypostatic union. First, that Christ has two distinct natures, humanity and deity. He is undiminished deity. And i very careful in the language here. Undiminished deity. He did not forfeit any of his attributes because that would make him less than God. So he's undiminished deity combined together forever with perfect humanity. Two, there is no intermingling mixture or intermingling of the two natures. In other words, his, his deity doesn't uh, somehow reduce to become humanity, and his humanity is not elevated to deity. Um, so there's no mixture or intermingling of the two natures. And three, uh, although he has two natures, Christ is one person. He is one person. So Jesus is the God-man. He is the God-man. Uh, <clears throat> he is eternal God. He was born of a woman in time and space. Galatians 4.4, 4, a very insightful passage. Paul says, but when the fullness of the times came, the fullness of the time, 
uh, speaks of the right time, that when, when God the Son took upon himself humanity, he did it at the exact time in human history that was in accordance with the Father's plan. Jesus did not come into the world uh, during the time of Abraham or during the time of Moses, although you do have uh, theophonic appearances, uh, Christoph- Christophany, an Old Testament appearance of Christ. Uh, the hypostatic union occurred at the exact time in human history that God determined. So this is the fullness of time. God sent forth his son, notice, born of a woman, born under the law, born of a woman, a true humanity, and he was born under the law, that is, under the Mosaic law as the rule of life. And so he was born of a woman in time and space, a real person, a real historical person in time, and in space. And uh, one other point here, <clears throat> I find it fascinating that the one who gave the law came into this world and took upon himself humanity and submitted himself to the law in order that he might fulfill the law. And only Jesus could do that. <laughs> As God, he is omniscient. But as a boy, he grew in knowledge. Luke 2.52 tells us that Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. So he had to grow. Remember here, again, you want to keep these these things in your understanding. That as as a child, he grew up and he had to learn vocabulary and grammar. And he had to learn the basics of uh, education. As God, he created the universe. As God, he created the universe. But as man, he is subject to weakness. He can become hungry and and thirsty. Concerning the complexity of the union, Lewis Berry Chafer states, and here I'm quoting from Dr. Chafer, he says, quote, The reality in which undiminished deity and unfallen humanity united in in one theanthropic person has no parallel in the universe. It need not be a matter of surprise if from the contemplation of such a being problems arise which human uh, competency cannot solve. Nor should it be a matter of wonder that since the Bible presents no systematized Christology but rather offers a simple narrative with its attending issues, that the momentous challenge to human thought and investigation, which the Christ is, has been a major issue in in theological controversy from the beginning to the present time, end quote. And he's absolutely right on that. Now, we struggle to comprehend, we struggle to comprehend the union of God and man. Uh, And that's true, because how do you bring two things that by their very nature seem incompatible? God is all-knowing. Christ is limited in his knowledge. God is eternal. Christ comes in in a point of time. God is infinite. Christ is finite. God is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. Christ could become weak. Um, And so God is eternal. He cannot die. Christ can die. So how do you how do you bring these two these things these two things together? There's there's a tension there. So we struggle to comprehend the unity of God and man. However, uh, by the way, a proposition um, uh, a problem does not destroy a proposition. <laughs> we have certain problems in our understanding it, but the proposition is true. It is very clear that this is what the Bible teaches. So we struggle to comprehend the union of God and man. However, it is with certainty that the Bible portrays him this way. And this union is essential to Christianity. It is essential to Christianity. As God, Jesus is worthy of all worship and praise. He is worthy of all worship and praise. Uh, Notice here we have a man who was healed by Jesus, and he says to him, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. He worshipped him. And so, Jesus received worship. As a perfect sinless man, he went to the cross and he died a substitutionary death in our place. He died a substitutionary death in our place. Mark 10.45 says, uh, 
For, for this, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. In 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, Paul says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. And the word for there translates the Greek preposition huper, huper, uh, which is the preposition of substitution. And that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ also died for sins once for all. He died for sins once for all. He died in our place. That's penal, substitutionary, atonement. Penal, he bore the penalty for our sins. Substitutionary, he died in my place. He bore the punishment that belonged to me. He died in my place. And I didn't even ask for that. That happened 2,000 years ago before I even came into this world. He died in my place, and he died as my substitute, and his death was an atoning sacrifice, and it propitiated the Father. It satisfied the Father, and he bore the wrath of God that rightfully belongs to us. And the end result is that we receive the gifts of righteousness and eternal life. The gifts of righteousness and eternal life. Jesus says, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. I give, in the Greek, that's didomi, didomi. It is a present tense uh, verb here. I give, didomi, present tense, which means it is a right now truth. Eternal life is not what you can have. It is what you have at the moment of faith in Christ. Now, it finds its fullest expression when you leave this world and you enter into the eternal state, but eternal life is what we have. And to reinforce this, Jesus says, and they will never perish. Well, uh, the word never here, uh, never perish, never, there's two ways to say no in Greek. Uh, there's two words. There's u and me. But when those are brought together, when you have u, me, together, as it appears here, it is emphatic. It is a double negative. It is the strongest negative. So we might say they will never, never perish. It's impossible. It just simply cannot happen. So not only do we receive eternal life, but we also receive the gift of righteousness. In fact, in Romans 5.17, Paul calls it the gift of of righteousness. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, He made him, that is, God made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You see, at the moment of faith in Christ, God gives you many things, but one of the things he gives you is the gift of righteousness. That's his righteousness, which is imputed to you and to me at the moment of faith in Christ. Now, you cannot improve upon the righteousness of God. You cannot add to it. You cannot take from it. It is a perfect righteousness. Paul talks about this in Philippians 3.9, where he uh, says that he may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Again, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Now let's move on in the notes here. So the following seven points are taken directly, directly from major Bible themes, pages 58 and 59. I just lifted it out and pasted it into my notes. First, he came to reveal God to men. He came to reveal God to men. He has explained him. Um, and by the incarnation, uh, the incomprehensible God is translated into terms of human understanding. So Jesus really explains the Father in a way that we can understand it. He came to reveal man. Uh, he is God's ideal man, and as such, is an example to all believers. Um <clears throat> Uh, 1 Peter 2.21 says, For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. 
And so he is the ideal man. I wrote an article some years ago called, What, does it, what is a man? What, what does it mean to be a man? And of course, the worldly uh, ideas of manhood are very different than the biblical idea of manhood. But he is God's ideal man, and as such, is an example to believers. Uh, but he is never an example to the unsaved, since God is, is not now seeking to reform the unsaved, but rather to save them. In other words, he doesn't call the unsaved to be better, to be moral, to be good. I mean, those are good things in and of themselves, but that doesn't save. And he's not calling them to be reformed. He's calling them to turn to Christ, that they might believe in Christ and have eternal life. And point number three, he came to provide a sacrifice for sin. By this reason, he is seen thanking God for his body, and this in relation to the two, to the true sacrifice for sin. <clears throat> in uh, Hebrews chapter 10, I'm going to start in verse 5. It says, Therefore, when he comes into the world, this is God the Son taking upon himself humanity. When he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering uh, you have not desired, but a body. Again, catch the language. But a body you have prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sins, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book, it is written of me to do your will, O God. And after saying sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them, which are, which are offered according to the Mosaic law. Uh, then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. By this, notice verse 10, By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Whereas the Old Testament sacrificial system was repeated year after year after year ongoing, Christ's sacrifice is a one and done event. It is one and done. And so when he comes into the world, he's thanking God for his human body, and this in relation to uh, true sacrifice for sin. Point number four, he came in the flesh that he might destroy the works of the devil. <clears throat> Point number five, he came into the world that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest uh, in things pertaining to God. Point number six, he came into, he came in the flesh that he might fulfill the Davidic covenant, the Davidic covenant. In his glorified human body, he will appear that's in the future, he will appear as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and he will sit on the throne of his father David. That will happen. That will happen. It has not happened in history, but God cannot lie. His word is true, and it cannot fail. And it is declared that here, when God, when Gabriel, the angel Gabriel, told Mary that the Lord God will give him, that's Jesus, the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and ever, and his kingdom will have no end. He will come. He will reign. And as incarnate, he becomes head over all things to the church, which is the new creation, <clears throat> the new humanity. Chafer states here, quoting Chafer again, quote, In the incarnation, the Son of God took upon himself not only a human body, but also a human soul and spirit, thus becoming both the material and immaterial sides of human existence. He became entire man, and so closely and permanently related to the human family that he is rightly called the last Adam. And in Philippians 3.21, the body of his glory is now, is now an abiding fact. He who is the eternal Son, Jehovah God, was also the son of Mary, the boy of Nazareth, the teacher and healer of Judea, the guest of Bethany, the Lamb of Calvary. He will yet be the King of glory, and he is now the Savior of men, the high priest, uh, the coming bridegroom, and Lord. End quote. 
So that will conclude our section concerning uh, Jesus, his deity, his eternity, and his incarnation. Uh, Next time we will pick up and we will talk about God the Son, his substitutionary death. So I hope this has been helpful to you, and I thank you very much for taking the time to listen. Wishing you a blessed day.